reason for being here this evening is to talk about design. And uh, from my perspective, there's been about four really engaging aspects of the design uh, vocation that I brought here this evening to talk to you about. Uh, I'll take probably a little bit of time on three of these areas, and I'll take a little more time on the on the fourth area, which is a new thing that's emerged, and it's called, and I don't know, has anybody here heard of design thinking as a management process? Could you raise your hands if you've heard that? You're all on Master's in Business Administration, after all, so you're looking at business management, organizational dynamic, uh, the science of management, all that goes with it. So it seems to me I thought that, I thought that would be apt to, to bring that in. Certainly from my point of view as a designer, I believe it's, uh, it's an area that has a real upside for the industry in general. So um, I've got to be cognizant of time. I'm almost set here. My notes. Bear with me. Going to the same. Okay, so we just set this up here. Is, is this in the way? I guess it might be. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, the company's Gordon Group. I founded it in 1987. I was 27 years old. And uh, I realized very early on in uh, starting my own business that I had to extend value to. Uh, the clients that I was going to attract. So, I, you know, this idea of design, I, I mean, maybe I could take a minute and just ask people here while we're together for this little period, can people just share with me what they think design is? Anybody willing to offer an opinion on what the meaning of design is? Don't be, don't be shy, I mean, go for it. Yeah. So kind of the notion of making complex things clear for people yeah. so it's easy to use. Anybody, that's that's perfect. That's one one way you could describe it. Go ahead. For me, design is just like a unique brand. Mm-hmm. Um, that speaks to what you're trying to advertise to your consumers. Yes. And brand is a is a major uh, kind of aspect of design and Clearly, that's an area that one could easily spend another hour on, but absolutely brand will factor significantly into the idea of design, and you're going to see that in my presentation. So, you know, depending on who you talk to and depending on individual background, uh, we all have a different view of what design is. And, but from my point of view, starting a new business, you know, going out there trying to make a living, I need to come up with some pretty clear definitions of what design is because after all people were going to buy my product unless I had this figured out so hopefully this will work boom the the little hour presentation I have is broken down into four areas I want to try to be as concise and clear and please don't let me uh, go off on tr off on tangents here too much because I tend to do that I'll use time up uh, and we won't make the best of this bottom line from my point of view is design comes in as a practice uh, in some org and this is very evident in different organizations, depending on their scale and depending on their investment in design and how they see design as integral to their operations. Uh, in certain organizations, you'll see design as part of their culture. It's, it's emblematic of who they are, their personality and their identity. And more often than not, in you'll see strong uh, companies that are celebrating design have strong brands. It's clearly a competitive advantage. The other, so, so I was looking at, okay, you know, the practice of design, that fits pretty well anywhere on the spectrum. Only certain companies are going to embrace design and build it in as a part of their culture. That's number two. Number three, that was from my point of view very uh, meaningful, was the notion of making design accessible, which is another definition for design. And these things aren't all separate from one another, but the idea of access is the notion of making information easy to understand, a very simple concept. But in this day and age today where we're 
totally flooded with technology, graphics, you know, video, and so on and so on. The idea of filtering out all the noise and getting to really clear ex uh, meaning is, I think, an admirable vocation for people to pursue. So that, for me, worked quite effectively, talking to clients about the notion of access. The last few years, there's been this new narrative that's come out, and it's this notion of design thinking. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more at length as part of this time we have together. But it basically is a management construct that is uh, being discussed extensively among academia and leading corporations today. What, what has become evident, you look at Apple for example, is management is starting to look at the uh, design as an approach to managing their organizations. So, Back in the 50s, uh, Watson used the term good design is good business. A lot of this stuff isn't new, it's been recycled, but uh, from the point of view of uh, laying down a framework for design as part of a management construct, it's, it's I think something to look at in terms of um, your studies, in terms of how you can apply design to the types of initiatives you're pursuing in terms of your career aspirations. Fundamentally, what's being discussed with design thinking is this notion that you, through uh, trying new things, use a Steve Jobs reference, connecting the dots going forward, getting over some of maybe the failures and hard, hardships that you've faced in the past, you tend to open up opportunities. If you only live in the past, unfortunately, you won't, uh, exp you won't be able to identify opportunities. And this is the, the trap, I guess, organizations fall into, is they're not challenged to look ahead. They're looking at reliable factors, like, and, and again, I'll go into this in more detail. But the notion of design thinking is one of designing pathways for growth into the future. Uh, I want to make a point a little bit about the, just this sheer volume of information that we deal with today through uh, the internet, and that uh, there is opportunity within the design field to differentiate and cut through that noise and raise the standard of design in a way that will create a more powerful message. And essentially, we're all designers today utilizing technology, whether it be, you know, using Twitter or Facebook or writing a blog or uploading a video, we in effect ha are in a situation where, you know, design has been democratized and essentially what we're witnessing is an amazing amount of content being uploaded and a lot of it unfortunately isn't designed and it's creating a great tsunami of noise. So design is becoming more and more critical for, for organizations and individuals or even countries to differentiate themselves. So, the, back to trying to sell design services back in the early, late 80s, I guess. One of the things that we were taught back in school, and this is something that I think resonates uh, a great deal, especially today when there's so much noise online, is the notion of less is more. And uh, in each case, when I talk about one of these constructs, I'm going to put forward a name that you could, if you're so inclined, you can do a little more digging on these people. But less is more is the idea of, you know, boiling it down to the core message and uh, eliminating fat or eliminating stuff that's sensational or taking out extraneous information that doesn't support your message. And I, I can't help thinking this is so uh, applicable across so many areas. Quite frankly, the school, I think, seems to me I'm going to be going on a limb here, the school wants to attract the best in class in terms of scholars. The, the school doesn't want half the applicants, people paying big bucks for tuitions, to fail. So, I mean, if it's all failure, then you've got a weak link. I know in my business, uh, with my team, I want the best employees. I, the, we're going to get judged on the weakest link. 
And there's a metaphor here, it seems to me, if you think of car design, a Porsche, everything on that Porsche is absolutely the best, you know, industrial design they can leverage to keep the cost a certain amount. They don't put like crappy product on the back end of the Porsche because of course that'll make the car not as efficient. Uh, so when we look at less is more, it's about defining the, the strength in terms of what is essential to make the design the best it can possibly be. And one of the architects I studied extensively and, and admire is uh, Le Corbusier. Of course, you'll recognize this chair, which is sort of an icon of the, uh, the, uh, the whole design you know, milieu. But his whole thing was uh, modernism, boiling it down to the absolute essential. No, uh, he hated the Victorian age. He hated ornate. He designed this Savoy house in uh, France, which is simply a box. But it's got this character of aesthetic about it that's actually quite striking. Uh, and he's a good read. And uh, he also designed the United Nations building. There's some controversies to his design was stolen for that. But uh, there's, there's legends who uh, we can source to get more reference on any of these concepts. And certainly modernism and the notion of less is more is one design um, I guess uh, factor, there's many others, there's deconstruction, there's, uh, it just goes on and on. One of the greatest uh, countries in the world that celebrates minimalism and modernist design, of course, is Switzerland. And we were trained extensively to work, follow the Swiss design model as part of our um, course. Because of course, because the whole notion was based on a grid and developing simple concepts that were extremely clear in terms of their effectiveness communicating. So the whole notion of this idea of, uh, how's it, how am I doing? Is this interesting for everybody? Is this kind of, because I'm going to go to the next one. And if, if you have any questions at any time, please, by all means, feel free. Because, I mean, we're only here for an hour. And then if, how many, any practicing designers in the room, like anybody that's sort of dabbled in it, feel taken concept to market in one way or another, sold something to a client? Not really. So this is a little bit of a, a different point of view, I suppose, from what you would normally be looking at during your uh, course curriculum here. Somewhat really. The notion, again, I'm using metaphors, visual metaphors, get it back to what's meaningful. And uh, cutting through the clutter and the crap to uh, hit a chord with with your, for your clients so that whatever the product is that's going out is going to resonate, it's going to persuade, is going to help people to aspire, to want or understand or uh, find meaning in, uh, in the solution. And that can be applied to a Facebook page after all, or to a blog, or to, or to an annual report. I brought a bag of uh, product. If there's time, I'd be happy to show you some of the pieces we've done just in the last year. One of, the, one of the biggest inspirations, I think, for, for uh, minimalism in design has to be the natural world. And I put this slide up just to, you know, if, I think there's a lot of inspiration that can be found from looking at uh, elements of nature. Because after all, uh, elements of nature are essentially boiled right down to the absolutely most essential parts required. So I think it's inspirational. I think a lot of design can come from thinking can, or concepts can come from looking at the natural world. I'm moving on now to the notion of culture. And, uh, you know, if as practitioners in the design field, we can we can go out and do orders, and we can, we can respond to clients' individual requirement to help them with an annual report, or a logo, or maybe it's a website, or what have you, some writing. At the end of the day, uh, some organizations out there will build, the, build design in as a cultural construct of who they are. And of course, Apple is sort of the leader in that. They've been known for that. Um, culture is it, where, where you bring design in, uh, to an organization where it's sort of top down, the senior uh, executive is totally uh, engaged, and he this this notion of design is extended throughout the the entire uh, 
base of, of the organization from the staff profile out to stakeholders and so on and so forth, it sets up a significant barrier, it seems to me, to competition uh, due to the, the, the way design is used to differentiate the organization. And uh, these are exciting times when you can find a client that is willing to make this level of investment. But frankly, most brands today that are leading have, have made, made that commitment and have invested heavily in, in design. Um, I don't, does anyone recognize this guy, Paul Rand? If anyone's interested in corporate identity design, Rand designed IBM's logo. But he was res re um, kind of a legend during the latter part of the 20th century, uh, working out all these corporate identity systems. And one thing that I found interesting, I've, there's a great book that he has, it's called The Designer's Art, and uh, it's all about design literacy. And simple things like um, talking about, for example, the Starbucks logo up there in the corner, I'm not supposed to go in deep on this, but you could, each of these logos has an, an you could do an analysis on. The Starbucks logo uses a human element. And within his book, which is extremely uh, engaging in terms of how he describes his rationale for these logos, the, he puts in an Aboriginal corn mask and he says logos today are essentially the same as what indigenous people use through the ages in terms of developing masks. And that there's an, a, kind of an evolution that's taking place where corporations today are, the, uh, are putting out these identities as the sort of the face of their organization. And to the extent they're designed, there is, uh, there is actually meaning in, within these various um, visual marks, whether it be typography, whether it be circles, whether it be human elements, uh, whether it be a form of a cross in the BMW logo, there we, we identify uh, due to deep-rooted primal uh, elements, we identify with, uh, with the meaning of these things. And they become ubiquitous in our, in our life. So Rand is a great person to read. And he was instrumental in building, uh, in building design within organizations where essentially design supported the whole culture, helped to form ethos both from the client side, both from the customer base, uh, holistically. So we've talked a little bit about product design, I've talked a little bit about how design factors in terms of developing, uh, supporting a whole culture and evolution within organizations. Uh, the third area I wanted to talk, touch on, which has been, um, a fairly powerful um, aspect of marketing communications, specifically design, whether it be again for websites or whether it be for brochures or for corporate identities or what have you. This idea of access really resonated for me back in the, uh, in the 80s when I started the company. And the notion here is uh, one of uh, you know, we're not about just designing stuff that looks pretty that we're going to put up on the wall and nobody's going to understand what it means. It's the notion of access is to make information, structure it in such a way so that people can find a pathway to meaning. And that goes to the whole idea of, my God, it's information anxiety today. Look at the stuff that's coming down on us in terms of how much information is, is, is needed to be processed, whether it be... Uh, Again, videos, social media, you know, corporate branding coming at us. There's, a, there's, there's an opportunity for designers to structure content in such a way that it takes the anxiety out. And the classic example would be, you know, when you go to Ikea and you're going to assemble a, a, you know, a bookshelf and uh, the instruction manual is like totally messed up and the screws aren't clear and you build a thing, you realize you've not put the parts on the right order and of course you've got to start all over again. That, that is poor design in the sense of making information clear and meaningful. There's a genius in this uh, milieu who uh, I admire a great deal. His name is uh, Richard Saul Wormann, and he's down in uh, Newport, and he's done remarkable things. 
you may not be aware, he was the founder of the TED conference. So he was using this principle of design to bring technology, education, and design leaders together and have a forum for them to all talk among themselves. And of course, you can go online and re see all these great videos. That's, Werman was the, the brilliant uh, thinker behind that one. He also had a publishing business, uh, which I believe he sold, which was called Access. And he designed uh, for people books on cities. So if you were sort of a competitive competitor to Fodders, if you wanted to go to Paris, you could buy a Worman's book, Access Paris, and you could find your way around to uh, go check out the Louvre or you know, go into the sort of suburban areas. He's brilliant about organizing information. He claims there's five finite ways to do that. I don't have that at the top of my tongue here, but uh, he also designed um, medical books to help people understand the anatomy. Uh, he's worth checking out, and it's a brilliant uh, school of thought that he, uh, he's a prophet for. Uh, so access as well, there's another level to access today, and we're going to hear more and more about it. There's legislation coming. This notion of access has to work for people who can't see well or have uh, hearing disabilities or motor skill disabilities. The term that's being used is called accessibility. All, all our media has to be conformed to make that uh, work for, for people with disabilities. And there's a significant upside, obviously, if we make information more accessible to people around the world, people who don't have all the, all the same standard of, uh, of uh, sensory abilities that average folks have. So that's an important function of access and something that's, again, that is going to be a new demand on designers to sort out. So here's what I wanted to get to, though, and I hope I'm doing okay here time-wise. Down to, maybe we can leave a few minutes for questions. Does, how does anyone have any questions or, yeah? The brand? Well, you had a picture of the PSW. Yeah. When I look at those, I have, I have a particular reaction. I don't know why. Because I don't know if that's just, and I'm not sure if I fully understood what you were. Well, here's, here, I, I think the last time I came over, I did a, a brand chat. Brand is, a, is, a, is an interesting s area to explore. It is something uh, that, again, will really help to differentiate organizations. I mean, I have a brand, you have a brand, we all have a brand. Organizations have a brand, countries have a brand. Um, what I was trying to get at, I guess, is that uh, for, for organizations that invest in design, uh, they stand, uh, it seems to me, to gain competitive advantage through making that, especially if the design is proved to be effective. Um, a company, like the obvious one, I, I, we hear so much about Apple, and I'm at risk of boring you more with Apple, but with all due respect, the Apple brand, okay, he, the guy brought it throughout the whole culture of the organization. You know, when you look at an iPad, it's, it is designed as less is more. It's a one-click button to change, you know, the, uh, the function of the device. It's, it's beautifully uh, tactile in your, in your hands. So, I mean, design is definitely supporting strong brands. I think it, it's fairly evident if you look at uh, Mercedes, or if you were to look at BMW, I mean, their advertising, their product, their writing, it's designed to a standard that is absolutely stellar. So if you put a Ford Focus next to that, it's just you're talking a higher order of uh, equity in the brand, which drives sales. It's, it's, it seems to me that's a fair analysis that we can make these days. Well, we're, we're going to go a little deeper on brand now. Now, brand is, is one that I'm fascinated with, and, I, and, I, and I, I would promote 
to anybody pursuing a design vocation to understand brand. There's a great, the, the prophet of brand is Acker, I think it's A-K-E-R. He has written the, the theoretical framework for, for brand leadership. And his basic model is, you, uh, coming at brand, you look at who's in charge, what's the identity framework, what's the architecture of the brand. Like, some, like I, I don't know, any of these brands, seems to me they might have a bunch of sub-brands and component brands and endorser brands. And then finally, how are you building that brand? What are the tools that go out? And uh, that's all design as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you can design the most remarkable story to tell about a product. And it can have all sorts of wonderful uh, archetype uh, elements in it that help persuade people to, to join the movement. Um, certainly the identity framework, an extension of that is all the visual, which is, this, is, this isn't brand here. This is an extension of brands. These are all, these are the graphic extensions of the brand. The brand is, uh, is much more than just the, the logo. But, you know, to have a remarkable story behind a company, have a crappy, like, visual reference for it, I think you've, you, that's a weak link in the chain, and you're going to get judged on that today. So the visual is, is absolutely essential in terms of the overall thinking, in terms of positioning of an organization. And, I, and again, I, I'm, I'm a strong design advocate, so I would say you got to have a certain amount of investment in, in the visual as much as the words and, and vice versa. I hope I've answered your question. Um, and I'm going to try to do justice to his academic position on all of this. He's been out on the speaker circuit. But I mean, it's a if you can think from my point of view, coming into the design field, I'm an order taker. Okay, I need an annual report, need a website, need to do a design for a logo. And suddenly we have the whole narrative changed. Guess what? You want your organization to be competitive. You want to be innovative. You got to think like a designer. So for me, it was like, a, holy smokes, I'll... Uh, I'll, 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 let, I'll get on that ship. I mean, I, let, let's not let that, one go, let that one go by. The, the way he describes it, and, I, and I, I, he takes the notion of reliability. So traditionally companies use all these specific processes like, you know, their bookkeeping, their, it's like scientific approach to management. What's worked in the past, we must keep doing that. We must not deviate from that. And the, the design thinker approach is, if I'm going to design a logo, I've got to come out with something absolutely original and new and different. And that is not reliable. In fact, you're hiring me because you want me to take some risks. Uh, we're risk takers, we designers. So Martin put the notion of reliability up against validation. And he's saying that organizations need to get out of the reliable, use the reliable, you can't dish, ditch that or, or, or let that go, but you need to start thinking like a designer thinks and prototype and sketch and play with plaster scene and take videos and you know, write stories and innovate to come up with a new goal, new objective. So I'm going to try and talk through this in the few minutes we have left. Gosh. Uh, so. We, we, in this visual, what we've tried to do is wrap the idea of design thinking around what is the corporation's goals and objectives? Or what are your goals and objectives? I mean, after all, you can ask yourself these questions because you guys are all indiv individuals who are going to strike out and pursue your specific vocation. Or maybe you're already in vocations and your companies are going to look to you to innovate. So design thinking may be something to contemplate in terms of a way forward. What was really... Uh, kind of prophetic for me was, you know, and I, I go into a bit of a digression on this stuff, but design for a lot of organizations is like way down there. Okay, I get the designer and we need the annual report done. Uh, or we need the poster or we need the website. You know, we want a skin. And I've always struggled with uh, why we're not up there with the lawyers and the accountants. And so, well, now again, this whole notion of design thinking came along, it's kind of validates, guess what? It's actually quite critical what designers do. They're helping to innovate. They're making a difference in terms of the solutions. They could actually come up with a little nugget of idea that will incubate an idea that will grow into an absolute, you know, 
successful outcome. So what it's done, this narrative, is it's introduced the designer as a more uh, critical role in the organizational management. And to that end, we're now sitting next to the CEO. We're no longer just you know, doing a little design thing on the Mac in the corner. And I, I find that uh, quite uh, compelling. And I want to talk about that because I think, I, in fact, I can see where that's happened in 25 years we've been doing business. I don't know if you absolutely need to have this haircut, but <laughs> anyway, um, so it does force one to think about the organization you're going into. And you need to think about the, who's, who's got the influence, CEO, is it lower rank, where is design being worked on in the organization? What are the, some of the core uh, fundamentals of the organization in terms of uh, who the stakeholders are, who, who, how are they dealing in governance, who are the clients, and who are the target audiences? And uh, what is the machinery of the, of the organization made of? Because after all, if I'm going to come in there and innovate, I need to be comfortable, very confident about who these people, who I'm working for. Uh, and the, the, what's really cool about design thinking is it's, a, it's, it's saying to companies, okay, traditionally it's been this top-down approach where, you know, the CEO makes the call and everybody follows the CEO's uh, mandate and that's the way it's running and welcome to the organization. But the design thinking model is one of bring in the team. Bring in the best team, the, t the, 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 the strongest links of the organization. And guess what, that might be anybody with, in the rank and file right up to the senior management. Or it may be the target audience, people from uh, constituents who are, uh, you're selling product to. So it's the notion of bringing people together. It's also the notion of looking at the, cl uh, the customer journey. That is, when do, if I'm gonna buy a iPad from Apple, when did I first hear about that? Uh, where, did, where was that first touch point? Right through to, okay, I'm going into a Mac store now. It seems as though I'm, uh, you know, I'm ready to make the purchase. The whole experience uh, the, uh, in the store, uh, the transaction, the packaging, the first uh, cracking the box and s making the thing work. Uh, the customer journey is part of the design management process. We need to understand all those steps all along the way. We also need to understand the value chain in terms of the organization from the time it, all those various steps involved in, in developing product and the interface with clients. The, uh, the notion is through a forum where we bring the team together and we brainstorm like we do as designers. We, we try metaphors, we write stories, we, we try to come up with themes that are uh, you know, going to hit a chord in terms of our clients' target audiences. We develop prototypes. All of these various tactics to essentially connect the dots, to use a Steve Jobs reference, going forward. And uh, I think the, typically uh, in organizations, people aren't used to doing this sort of role playing stuff or getting out of the traditional mold, but it's remarkable things that emerge when we start letting our guard down and pushing off and trying things differently. So this is what this uh, slide is supposed to basically represent the notion of trying out different ideas and, and challenging one another without being, you know, uh, without, without sort of discouraging people from the sharing their points of view. Uh, the company that you might want to look into that does this sort of thing in a major way internationally is IDEO, I-D-E-O. And they're in, they've got a, a wonderful model called human centered design. And they're doing remarkable things like helping in you know, third world countries and getting drinking water into uh, locations. You know, I work with Aboriginal people and one of the things they face is mining companies showing up and wanting to put a mine next to their reserve. And it seems to me there's a great opportunity to sort out, okay, what's the relationship gonna be there in terms of corporate social responsibility and the mind's intent in terms of sharing, making it equitable for the people that might be uh, marginalized one way or another. Uh, it seems to me design thinking can apply in so many different areas. So you're, you're basically left with what if we tried this or that? And uh, 
in the interest of uh, wrapping this up, the final test of you know, winning outcomes with design thinking, and frankly for all these various approaches, is will the client buy? And if the client endorses it, and hopefully you've had the client involved along the way, uh, it seems to me you've had a positive outcome. And then you basically see the results of that when the product goes to market or the solution is implemented through whatever support uh, behind, the, behind the, the whole process.